Sarah, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, American colleagues, and uh, good, uh, good afternoon to the European colleagues, and uh, good evening to our Asian colleagues. And welcome you again to this World River and Delta System Source to Sink webinar series. Today is uh, our number 19 and uh, the webinar 2021, number 19. So we'll, we invited Professor Sarah Rosgaard from uh, the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago come here to talk about Amazon River, particular organic carbon, all the ways from source and the feet in the lab, in the field, the lab and the classroom. So uh, before I introduce Sarah, I want to also uh, mention to you the World Large River Conference will be held in early August uh, in Moscow, Russia, but this is a hybrid format. So you can attend the face-to-face -face and also virtual one. So there are five topics, as you can see here, all the way from hydrology, sediment transport, river corrosion, integrated basin management, and also the Russia Arctic highlighted rivers. That should be a very interesting. So you should go to their website and have more information regarding the submission of the uh, abstracts and the registration. And so next week, as always, uh, we have two more talks. Uh, Sag Cohen from University of Alabama will talk about sediment modeling in the large global river system. This is the large scale modeling, give us a big picture of the global river uh, system and delta. And uh, next Friday, Brian Romans from uh, Virginia Tech, uh, he will talk about also Amazon, but uh, focus on a little bit of the deep sea fan system and also the other side of the Chile basin. Uh, I think both are, should be very interesting. But also I want to uh, uh, ask your attention, the timing this week and next week is uh, London 1 p.m., Paris 2 p.m. because the summer saving, uh, U.S. already summer saving time, but uh, European will starting their summer saving time only on March 28. So after 28, we will resume the London 2 p.m. and Paris 3 p.m. Okay. Um, Sarah, uh, as I mentioned, is an uh, assistant professor from uh, uh, the Arts Institute of Chicago, Depart Chicago, the Department of Liberal Arts. I mean, you may be wondering, oh, uh, what's going on? Well, you know, so Sarah was, a, as you can see, she got her PhD from, is a chemical oceanographer from MIT Woods Hole program. How come he, she ended uh, Arts Institute uh, uh, there? Uh, so uh, I haven't uh, re uh, 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 I haven't heard the Sarah talk. I don't know what exactly she talked. I'm pretty sure uh, she will combine her pure science research and community as uh, a student education. I think this is exactly what we need, uh, particularly in the source to thinker community. Not only the pure uh, research field work, but also how we can exchange convert convert our knowledge to the community, to the local students particularly. So as uh, here you, sh you see Sarah, uh, a graduate from MIT Woods Hole and, and then got a, a postdoc fellowship in the U UBC uh, and also is Arctic Edge Society Outreach Engagement Coordinate. And she has a couple publication, a very good one. And uh, as you see here, um, she got an NSF gra graduate research fellow and also the, uh, the training our future ocean leaders post fellowship and the global outreach initiative award and the MIT uh, PK12 STEM camp grant and also postdoc uh, fellowship award. So uh, uh, think, I think I will give the floor to Sarah and uh, uh, Sarah, go ahead. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to this community today. I wanted to start though by acknowledging the violence that was inflicted on Asian American communities this week in um, the United States. And so I would like to start by just having a brief moment of silence to acknowledge that.
Yeah, and I, I know that a lot of us must be coming to this talk holding the weight of those current events um, today. And so I appreciate everyone coming here this um, at this time. So I will share my screen now and um, introduce what I'll talk to you today about. So, um, so I will be talking about the Amazon River Basin. And I realized that I know that my talk follows a lot of great talks in this series that have really dove into the complexity of sediment and particle dynamics in the Amazon River Basin from the Andes Mountains to the um, coastal Atlantic Ocean. And today I'll be focusing more on the floodplain, um, but I really encourage you, and I'll, I'll be focusing more in particular organic carbon, but I really encourage you to um, watch some of those older talks last fall and this winter that um, go into a lot, of, a lot more detail in some parts of the land to sea continuum. The work that I'll be presenting today is really a collaboration among myself and a lot of my co-authors Fallier, Jose, Rob, Anne, and they've come from, we, we all come from a variety of different institutions from Woods Hole Oceanographic and Woodwell Climate Research Center and University of British Columbia, where I did my postdoc to Florida State University and Universidad Federal do Oeste do Pará. And so these um, players will come back a lot in the talk. Um, and I, and in addition to that, um, there are a lot more people I should thank for the knowledge that I'll be presenting to you over the next hour. And so I just wanted to acknowledge them up front before I actually start presenting. Today, I'll be focusing um, primarily on particulate organic carbon in the Amazon River Basin, so more in the floodplain. And I'll be, I'll be talking a lot about this methodology for analyzing their composition. Um, called ramp temperature oxidation. And I, I want to show you the different things that you can do with this methodology and how that methodology is moving forward even beyond this research project. And, and I'll end by talking about the communities that we work in and my thoughts about engaging them in different ways to do that and why that's important. So today I'm talking to you from the, the ancestral lands of the Musqueam Nation here in North America. But I'll be direct, directing our attention to a variety of ancestral lands of many indigenous communities that live throughout the Amazon River Basin. So that's what I'm showing you here. This resource is from nativeland.ca and I encourage all of you to look at it if you're curious to learn more about the indigenous lands that you live on and take resources from. Today, um, the Amazon has is home to at least 30 million people across nine nations. And the cross-continental river from the Andes to the Atlantic Ocean is at least 2.5 million years old. So this is a huge area um, encompassing various land landscape types and at least eight major tributaries, which I'm showing you here. There's a huge sediment flux that comes from these tributaries into the Atlantic Ocean because this is the largest, largest drainage basin on the planet. Um, and it has the largest river discharge as well to the ocean. The Amazon River supplies 20% of global freshwater discharge to the ocean. It ranges from the Andes Mountains all the way through the main stem as you see, it has a huge sediment flux to the ocean. Um, and that's in part because it is uh, the largest river by discharge as well, supplying about 20% of freshwater flux to the oceans. And so included in that drainage basin is also a major uh, organic carbon repository. Um, and so when you think of that major sediment flux coming from that rich, sediment rich river, it's mobilizing a lot of carbon in there as well. And this landscape is changing really fast. Um, the drainage basin, basin is 7.5 million square kilometers. Um, and it's changing a lot due to deforestation, um, land degradation and uh, climate change feedbacks, which um, some of which have been intensifying in recent decades. So then when we step back and look at the carbon cycle, we can begin to understand what important role the Amazon 
plays in that. So this is the most updated global carbon budget that I could find. And it includes in the arrows, the anthropogenic perturbations in the carbon cycle in the last uh, 12 or so years. And then uh, and the, the major reservoirs that have been um, accumulating carbon in different places, which you see here from the different arrows and the numbers. So we're all familiar with this flux, this perturbation probably, it's due to um, fossil fuel burning. Uh, and on, on average, it's been about 10 gigatons per year in the last 12 years. And then in the background, there's always been this land sink um, from um, uptake of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into vegetation and then eventually into permafrost and soils on longer time scales. And then rivers um, have the give the chance for that organic carbon mobile, um, stored in land to be mobilized into rivers. And so um, because of land use change and climate change related feedbacks, compared to pre-industrial times, we've been, rivers have been mobilizing um, a gigaton more organic carbon in soil reservoirs mainly per year. So the Amazon River Basin is a good, there's so many sediments coming from there. It is a good opportunity to, to learn more about what happens to particles that are mobilized in rivers. And that's and particular organic carbon that gets mobilized. So in rivers like the Amazon, it's really, I see it like a balance between um, transport and respiration. When I, when I think about what happens to particulate organic carbon in rivers. Um, so, and I kind of think about this in, in between two extremes. So, so scenario A is one extreme. Um, in scenario A, the transport term is really strong, meaning that whatever gets mobilized from land into rivers ends up being preserved and buried in the coastal ocean. And then scenario B, the other extreme is whatever gets much less gets buried compared to what's mobilized because of processes that are happening in between, like carbon dioxide evasion due to respiration or sediment storage in the floodplains in the river basin. Um, and so in the end, less gets buried compared to what gets mobilized. So the Amazon River for decades has been considered closer to scenario B. Um, and that's because there's been large um, quantities of sediments being stored, which a lot of the previous talks have, have mentioned and described. Um, and also there's been um, substantial me measurements of carbon dioxide evasion, presumably coming from remineralization in the river system. And so the overarching objective of this talk and all the different parts of the talk are to ask ourselves, does the source of organic carbon matter and affect its fate? affect that balance between whether that those particles that particular organic carbon will be will be transported and buried versus remineralized in transit. Um, and so part one will be focusing on the main stem at Obidos mostly, um, as well as some tributaries looking at the origins and sources of organic carbon mobilized there. Um, part two will be connecting that to fate by looking at what gets buried in the coastal sediments. And then part three will be more about engaging with communities and some of the more recent work that I've been doing since this. Um, so especially for parts one and two, our ability to get at that question really depends on the tools that we have as organic geochemists. And I like to think that there's two, again, like two extremes in in the ways that we can look at the composition of organic carbon. We can look at it in bulk and we can look at specific biomolecules. And then we can measure specific parameters for both of those things, like um, nitrogen to carbon ratios and what I'll be mentioning a lot in, the, in this talk, um, stable and radiocarbon isotopes. So I, I decided to very quickly review isotopes, although I'm sure everybody is quite familiar with them in, the, in this talk, but I just taught isotopes in my two classes that I'm teaching. So I figured I'll just put the slides here. Um, so stable and radioactive carbon isotopes. So stable isotopes can be differentiated as such. So imagine carbon in two different uh, carbon dioxide molecules and one of the carbons has one more neutron. So that's carbon 13. So it's slightly more massive than carbon 12. It's a very small difference of one neutron, but it makes a big difference in terms of how that carbon dioxide molecule will behave in the environment. So 
what I mean is really in this process of photosynthesis, which is primarily how carbon gets from the atmosphere to land. And in photosynthesis, you can imagine a plant or an algae cell would prefer to take up the um, lighter carbon, the carbon 12 over the carbon 13. So this fractionation, this preference, we can measure and we display it in this notation called delta 13C. Um, and so that's how I'll be talking about it, presenting it in this talk. And the range in delta 13C values observed in organic matter nature is quite wide from minus 40 to minus 10. And it's diagnostic of, of something about the source of organic carbon, because we can see how different sources of organic carbon, especially on land, can partition um, between plants and soils, marine algae, petrogen petrogenic organic carbon. So this is a good proxy for the source of organic carbon. And then the other um, isotope that we have that I'll be talking about is radiocarbon. So this has yet one more neutron and this carbon isotope is radioactive. So at a very steady rate, like a clock, it will decay to a stabler nuclide um, carbon or nitrogen 14. Um, and at a very steady rate. So um, assuming that we know how much radiocarbon uh, a sample and a, a chunk of organic matter starts with, we can measure how much is left today and back out the age of that, of that sample. And so um, we express this as cap del 14C or fraction modern. I'll be mostly using fraction modern in this talk. I mean, it ranges from zero to one, zero being a very old sample, one being a very young sample. So these two proxies are these two measurements, stable and stable carbon and radiocarbon, um, have been used a lot for decades in the Amazon River Basin to study um, the dynamics of organic carbon there. So this is a study that's almost a couple decades old, looking at the bulk comp isotope composition of um, carbon dioxide and dissolved organic carbon and suspended particulate organic carbon in the Amazon River. Um, basin. And what these authors are, saw was that the red values for carbon dioxide are quite different than the values, the isotope composition of DOC and POC. And so from that, they concluded that it's primarily the substrate for remineralization in the Amazon comes from uh, primarily young, relatively fresh plant sources in the Amazon River Basin. So they suggested that there is selective preservation of, of POC and selective remineralization of POC in the Amazon, which is which has inspired after all this time um, the questions that we'll be dealing with in this talk and in this study as well. So we're expanding that. Um, I guess my goal today is to expand that toolkit for geochemistry using this other method called Brandt oxidation, which is kind of in the middle in the spectrum of bulk to compound specific um, measurements. So in ramped, in the ramped oxidation technique, if you look at the left, we put, a, we put our sample like from the Amazon, uh, like particles from the Amazon in a furnace that we increase in temperature at a steady rate from room temperature to a thousand degrees Celsius. And we slowly oxidize that sample through time and through the temperatures. And that the oxidation products come out at the bottom and they're, they're linked to a vacuum line. And then with that vacuum line, we can trap organic carbon that gets oxidized in different temperature intervals. And um, so that's an example I'm showing here of um, how we tra we're trapping one sample, um, one fraction of organic carbon that's um, come out at specific temperatures. And in that gas, we can look at the isotope isotope composition of that carbon pool that, that got mobilized, that got oxidized in that, in that interval. So here are some examples of data that come from the ramped oxidation analysis. These are called thermograms. They're graphs of evolved carbon dioxide concentration against temperature on the x-axis. And first on the left here is um, a thermogram you would get from culturing um, coccolithophores. And these are not non-calcifying, so we don't have to worry about cal calcium carbonate in this thermogram. So that's very fresh organic matter from, from a petri dish and then from a culture and then, um, not a petri dish. Um, and then uh, on the, in the middle here on the right is a comparison to mesopelagic zone particulate organic carbon from about 80 meters in the water column in the Southern Ocean. 
Um, and so you see the difference there um, between those two um, thermograms. And then in addition, like I said, because of the vacuum line, we can trap carbon in specific intervals that corresponding to specific pools of carbon in the thermogram and use isotopes and um, measure the isotope composition of that carbon that oxidizes in those intervals. So that's what I'm plotting here on the left. Um, and the height of the bar is the isotopic composition of the gas. That got, that got released in those temperature intervals. So how we look at thermograms today is, um, is kind of, when we, look, when we think of thermal stability of carbon over the thermogram, we like to interpret it as some reflection of the intrinsic bond strength of the biomolecules that get um, oxidized in specific temperature intervals. So you can actually convert the temperature scale here to activation energy. And we think of, we think of thermograms as sums of infinitesimal organic carbon pools that are, that are on a spectrum of activation energy due to the different bond strengths of the organic molecules in those different pools that get released in the process. So that's how we'll be looking at thermal stability today in the Amazon River particulate organic carbon. So really we can ask, our, we can um, break down this overarching question into a few questions. How can we partition particulate organic carbon in the Amazon by its thermal stability? What's the link between thermal stability and then the fate of that organic carbon? Um, and then a little bit less related to thermal stability, but what I'll do in the end is talk about how communities can shape such research questions also. So to start, now that we have thermal stability as a tool to look at, we. I will start by just looking at particulate organic carbon in the main stem. Uh, at Obidos, uh, a few of the previous talks have described Obidos as the most downstream gauging station that, are, that is free from tidal influence in the Amazon River main stem. So that's for that reason, we got our samples from there. And um, we collaborated with some other groups that had gotten measurements from Solomois and Madeira rivers um, and the Tapajos River for comparison. So um, yeah, so we, we visited the main stem in two periods at high, high water level. There was a previous talk that talked about um, how variable the water levels are. So this is another example of that. Um, this is actually, I think, the Tapajos River Basin. We were still around the Tapajos River and not at Obidos yet. And you can tell from the watercolor, it's not very brown. Um, and we were working, yeah, we couldn't have done this without Jose Mora in Santarang and um, a bunch of um, hardworking Brazilian students that worked together with us. They, they had their own research questions too, but they were also helping a lot with the sediment. Um, measurements, Miyuki, Poliana, Hargiles, and Gabi. Um, and we, and here's Jose on the right, hugging our ADCP. We use an ADCP to get a cross section of water velocities at Obidos, which I'm showing you on the left here. And the color map is um, the water velocities, um, which we integrated to get discharge at those two times that we went to Obidos. So on the right is a hydrograph in 2014 when we went. Um, and the circles are our, our measurements of discharge from the ADCP. Generally, discharge was not so different between the two times, um, but they're at two times on either side of the, the peak water discharge for the year. So in April, the water was water levels were rising, and in July, the water levels were falling. And we use a depth-specific sampler to get um, particular organic carbon or to get total suspended solids um, at specific depths and locations in the cross sections to show that. So that's what I'm showing in the circles here. And this is just what it looks like when we deploy the depth sampler with the lids open. Um, we keep it horizontal in the river and, and lower it to the depth we're interested in. And then we use a bicycle pump, the pressure from the bicycle pump to close the lids at our location and depth of interest. And then we we um, lift it back up out of the water. And so here's a depth sampler that effectively deployed and it's full of that brown, brown colored river water um, that is very characteristic of the Amazon River main stem. This is at Obidos. And then we filtered um, the suspended solids with diameters larger than 0.22 microns. 
And here is a reconstruction on the right of suspended sediment um, concentration using um, a depth, a depth, um, a model for depth sorting, depth related sorting of the um, sediments by concentration. So you can see that here how there's much more sediment concentration at, in deeper depths um, than shallower um, in the cross section on the right. And we integrated the product of water velocity and sediment concentration to calculate um, a flux of, sediment, of suspended solids per second um, in April and July. So in April it was 53,000 kilograms per second and in July it was 48,000 kilograms per second. That was a sediment flux at Obidos going downstream. And then we also measured the particulate organic carbon concentration in the sediments to gener generally they're about 1% organic carbon. And so we also were able to construct um, cross-sectional concentrations of particulate organic carbon in the main stem. Again, there was, as you would expect, there, there's depth related sorting by, by depth um, of the particulate organic carbon concentration. And in April, it was 540 kilograms per second and in July it was 370, which I don't think it's the right thing to do this, but if we do scale it to per to annual, um, yeah, to annual fluxes, um, it's quite similar to previous, it's within range of, of previous estimates of organic, of particular organic carbon fluxes from the Amazon River Basin. So despite this depth related sorting in particular organic carbon concentration, um, there was very little variation of Amazon River POC by depth or location um, in, the, in the cross section. So here is plotted um, on the y-axis, the nitrogen to carbon ratio on the x-axis, delta 13C of the bulk car organic carbon um, collected at Obidos in April and July. So those are the circles. And there isn't much variation in the values here, relatively speaking. Um, when we, we took six of those samples from the main stem and analyzed them with the ramped oxidation method also to construct thermograms. And the thermograms are really similar to each other too, regardless of depth, regardless of season. Um, and when we look at specific gas fractions, so remember in these thermograms, I'm plotting bars, I'm overlaying them with bars um, to convey the isotopic composition of gas, radiocarbon and stable isotopic composition of the gas um, mobilized, released in specific intervals. And we try, generally the intervals are quite similar, the temperature intervals across these different thermograms. And um, in general, what I'm showing you here um, for the two sets of six samples, um, the isotopic composition, even in specific gas fractions, is not very different sample to sample. So um, when we look at the values, the bulk values um, of these samples um, in this nitrogen to carbon against delta 13C space, it tells us that the river POC is primarily reflecting the signal of fresh vegetation or soil organic matter. It could be either one. For we are quite sure it's not reflecting in-situ primary production. Um, that's more the signature of the Tapajos River POC we saw, um, which is the uh, green triangle here. And it's quite different, quite removed from Tapajos in this space here. But so it could be vegetation or soil organic matter. But then when we look at the thermograms again and the gas, the isotope composition of the gas fractions, that's how the gas fractions plot out. So here. Um, is the fraction modern against delta 13C for the individual gas fractions from all the thermograms that we got from Ovidos. And the color is the temperature of oxidation. Um, and you see that no matter what gas fraction we're looking at, they're, they're not, the, the isotope composition for those gas fractions are not very close to modern. And so this tells us that primarily um, particular organic carbon in the Amazon River main stem comes from soil organic matter sources. Um, it's not really from fresh vegetation. That's not what is in the suspended sediments. The other thing that I wanted to show you here on the right is that there's this trend from um, at cooler temperatures, um, the oxidation is reflecting younger 
carbon-13 depleted organic matter pools. And the, at the higher temperatures, the, um, the oxidation in the ramped oxidation technique is releasing older, the, uh, older soils or older organic matter um, that is more 13C enriched. So you have this um, trend where radiocarbon age, um, as age increases, the 13C enrichment increases. So that trend we think reflects the flushing of um, soils from different um, horizons in the floodplain. Um, because that's kind of what we expect in a soil profile in the Amazon River Basin, where the younger soils at the top are more 13C depleted and the older soils further down are more 13C enriched. And so, and we see a similar uh, pattern when we look at other tributaries as well. When we look at the Solon Lance River POC upstream and the Tapajos River downstream, we see something similar. Um, so here I'm plotting, I did the ramped oxidation analysis for those samples as well. So here I'm plotting um, all three tributaries that we looked at um, and the individual gas fractions that we separated in the ramped oxidation technique. The um, y-axis on the left is radiocarbon and the one on the right is delta 13C and the activation energy is what is on the x-axis. And you see how um, Generally, uh, you have the same trend towards uh, the higher, the, the pools of organic matter with higher bond strength, therefore higher activation energy. They tend to be the older pools that are more 13C enriched. Um, and I just wanna, I guess, point out, um, I haven't spent too much time looking at, at this. Uh, this is a more, this is a newer plot that I did, but um, the slopes are more similar than the intercepts is the main uh, take home message that I wanted to convey here. So perhaps even if each individual tributary is mobilizing different sources of um, soil organic matter, you have the same thing happening um, with the mixing of soils with different degradation histories in each uh, tributary. So um, yeah, I thought it was interesting that the data from all three tributary, well, the main stem and the solar moist and tapajos have a similar, exhibit a similar pattern. So this recaps part one. I hopefully showed you how thermal stability is, a, is one way to differentiate different soil organic matter pools that get mobilized into the Amazon River um, and, how the, and how it reflects soil organic matter with different degradation histories. And also just going back to the depth specific sampling method that we used Perhaps, although depth-specific depth sampling is important for estimating POC flux accurately, um, it might not be so important for um, understanding POC composition if there isn't much sorting by depth. So that's just, I thought that was an interesting result as well that could maybe improve the efforts that we focus on in future sampling at Obidos. So the second part is now trying to connect those different thermal stability, those, those different organic matter pools that we saw in the main stem to fate, to, to, their, to their fate in the coastal sediments. So a lot of this work is really being pushed forward by um, these individuals, Brenna, Kirsten Valle, Brad, Jose, um, who are doing a lot linking uh, all those um, ramped oxidation analyses that I just presented to um, the composition of sediments that get deposited in the Amazon mud banks. And so I'm gonna present this hypothesis that they're working on. And I really suggest that you contact them if you wanna talk about their, their hypothesis more and the field work that they have um, planned, the very exciting field work they have coming up for them. So to start, we're gonna look at things in fraction modern against Delta 13 C space again. And so here's, here's a composition of bulk POC at Obidos that I was just talking about. And here is when you separate out the POC in um, different gas fractions from the ramped oxidation, the RPO method. And then this is when you convert, um, convert it to activation energy. So like I had just showed you, the young POC soil pools are um, associated with the lower activation energy organic matter pools. And then the older stuff is associated with higher activation energy pools. 
And now um, this is how they look compared to the isotopic signature of the marine end, end member on the upper right corner, which is what you would expect for Atlantic Ocean primary production derived organic carbon. And then in the middle here is um, the bulk composition of organic carbon collected from mud banks um, from 1997 off of French Guiana. And so you see if you had to do, draw a mixing line between um, the marine island member and what comes from Ovidos, the only way to reconstruct what we see in the mud banks is to assume that there's mixing of a, of a relatively refractory um, organic matter pool relative to um, the bulk organic matter at Ovidos. Um, and it gets more complicated when you um, separate out the mud bank organic carbon pools by activation energy by um, through the RPO method, but but still you get the same conclusion that there must be some organic carbon. The the more um, the the pools with lower activation energy that get lost between Obidos and the mud banks um, along the the coast of South of underneath the Amazon plume, and so. Um, this, this reiterates that hypothesis that I talked about earlier that's been circulating, circulating around for a long time that there is selective degradation and therefore selective preservation of organic carbon between the main stem and Atlantic. But um, I'm really excited about um, Brenna, Kirsten, Brad, um, Jose Vallier's crews coming up because they will have the chance to kind of um, make that connection finally and um, collect mud bank sediments and uh, do a broad suite of RPO analyses on them. And uh, there was a previous talk, um, I think by Chuck, who was saying, talking about how the tidal section of the Amazon is vastly understudied compared to the main stem and the coastal mud bank sediments. So maybe by comparing, doing this comparison, um, this, these individuals will be able to fill in some of those gaps, um, especially especially maybe those gaps that exist in what happens in the tidal part of the Amazon River Basin. So that concludes part two. Um, and, and yeah, I want to just, to conclude this section, I want to now look at all the thermograms that I showed you. So I started by showing you um, thermograms of primarily marine organic matter, very fresh cultured phytoplankton organic matter on the left to um, mesopelagic organic matter that's still pretty young, and then Amazon organic matter, presumably coming from soils that is much older. And you see that there's a progression in the thermogram shape, um, almost with the degradation state of this organic carbon. And so we're beginning to make, make linkages. Therm uh, the RPO method is beginning to help us connect, better connect thermal stability to the molecular diversity of organic carbon in samples and their degradation state and therefore their fate in the, in the environment. Um, and, I, and I suggest you look at the recent contribution um, by Jordan Hemingway and his co-authors who are making these, beginning to make these connections um, in, in, in these thermograms. Um, so just a broader picture of perhaps what this method has in store for us going forward as more people use it. So, um, okay, we have like a little over 10 minutes left, which is great. And I just wanted to spend the rest of this time to talk about um, engaging with communities. I, I think um, it's an inevitable that we interact with communities when we travel to do research. And it's such, I feel so privileged. I feel like it's such a privilege that we had these opportunities. We had the money to go um, to these environments of global importance for the carbon cycle in the climate system. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what I, I think that you we can learn by talking to the communities when we travel there also. Um, and so I, th I think I spent more, uh, more time on that in recent years leading up to my um, uh, new assistant, assistant professorship in Chicago. Um, so to start this section, I just want us to think about this phenomenon, Encontro das Aguas, which is the meeting of the waters. It happens a lot in the Amazon River Basin where you have a very sediment rich tributary merging, meeting with um, a very sediment, sediment poor tributary. So I think this image 
taken by um, our colleague, Chris Linder, I think it was the meeting of the Solomois River, which is very sediment rich with the Rio Negro, which is really sediment poor. Um, but this also happens close to where we did field work that I was showing you. Um, this is the meeting of the Tapajos River downstream of Obidos and the Amazon main stem. And you can see from just Google Earth how different um, the colors of the rivers are. And then we, um, with Jose, who works with the community of Arapishuna, um, which is um, a Varzia, a flooded rainforest community um, between Santarén, or off, off a little bit away from Santarén, um, which is the city in Pará where we would often fly into, um, that community sits at that confluence of the two rivers. And so we um, visited the community and we, well, yeah, I guess we went back in 2018, we presented to our colleagues in Santarén our, our ramped oxidation results to talk to them about, about what we think is going on based on those results. And then we visited Arapishuna to work with um, school children in the community. Um, and we spent some time doing workshops on, on the topics of the science that we are studying, like why we, we are going to the Amazon River to what kind of questions that we are asking there and what kind of tools we have to look at river land dynamics in the Varzia, in the Varzia system, the flooded rainforest system. And then we also used um, artistic techniques to, well, yeah, we had the students um, kind of depict or, or summarize what we learned through the week with artwork. Um, and so we had them create this huge exhibit in, in the community of over 40 artworks depicting their experience and their knowledge of the Amazon and Tapajos rivers where they grew up. So here is the um, exhibition that we had in Arapishuna after we did the workshops with the students. And um, I guess, yeah, I didn't do any official research or anything, but um, based on these informal surveys with the students, we found that um, after our, our work with them, combining lab field and also artistic approaches to, um, to learn about the Varzia system, 40% more students felt that they had participated in a science experiment compared to before our activity together, our workshops. And then um, after our workshops, 10% more students said that they wanted to become a scientist. So I think that it was um, a successful way of um, engaging and getting the students to understand the science that we do when we come to um, the, the vicinity of where they live. And also I think for me and hopefully for the other scientists that I was with, um, it was an opportunity for us to learn more from the communities that we work in. I think it's inevitable that we have an impact on the communities when we, when we come from outside and travel to a place to do field work. And so I, um, I think that these opportunities and maybe through the art, there's a way for us to be better at learning from the communities too. And perhaps this learning process can drive some of our research questions going forward too. I thought the exhibition spaces were also really cool and uh, useful for, for that two-way exchange of knowledge as well. Um, we ended up uh, printing the artworks and um, connecting them to another chapter of these artworks um, that occurred in the Fraser River Basin through our colleagues, um, especially my colleague Bernhard Poiker Ehrenbrink at, in Woods Hole Oceanographic. So we um, displayed these artworks at Vancouver Science World as well, so that us in Vancouver could connect our experience of rivers to people in the Amazon and how they experience rivers. And we actually, um, I don't know if you can see my face right now, but um, Bernhard helped me um, uh, publish a lot of these, the artworks as greeting cards. Um, and then in the back, it has a little bit information about our Global Rivers Observatory that we're all part of. Um, and so these artworks actually really join a global a student exhibition on many river systems where our colleagues work. Um, and just from some of the comments that were left behind in the exhibition in Brazil and our exhibition in Canada, um, I felt just by reading some of the comments, I felt like there was learning going on um, 
And it was not only, yeah, it was not only the scientists driving that learning process. It was the community members um, being the teachers in many ways. So, so I'm very hopeful that um, going forward, it, it is possible to have more of these learning experiences from communities and have that be part of our research process. And that's what I've been working on in recent years. When I was a postdoc in Vancouver, I was working with a, a nonprofit in Inuit, an Arctic Indigenous nonprofit in Nunavut, uh, based in Nunavut, um, looking at how we can combine scientific data like satellite imagery of the ice surface and combine it with um, Inuit knowledge of environmental change and environmental risk. And we've been working together to put all these different knowledge sources on one platform um, so that communities can um, use all these different knowledge sources to for climate adaptation and community driven research community driven environmental policies. And then that's what I hope to continue in my just in my newest position that I just started um, in Chicago. I'm spending a lot more time now um, teaching, um, but I still am working on a on a research program there. But yeah, a lot of my learning goals for my students are about um, yeah, community research partnerships and, and learning about rivers, but learning about rivers to connect, to figure out ways to um, eliminate that gap between um, mm -hmm. our actions as people and the impacts that we have far downstream, like the Gulf of Mex Mexico dead zone and how our activities in the Mississippi Rivershed could actually contribute to that dead zone, um, you know, thousands of kilometers downstream. So those are some of the courses that I'm exploring at, and still building at the school since I'm just, it just started. Um, some of my colleagues do some great stuff looking at um, this intersection of chemistry, environmental chemistry and art too, such as my colleague Claire over at the Art Institute. Um, she actually visited a, a river basin in the Midwest and took and did soil chromatographies, um, very simple soil chromatographies on coffee filters, I think, um, to, to convey the it's kind of the same thing that we often look at, which is the well, it's the same things that I was talking about, which is like the landscape diversity and the molecular diversity of um, soils that are being mobilized in the Amazon. I, in some ways, I feel like she was conveying a similar thing with her um, soil chromatography exhibition that she was doing around this river basin. And then through, I think through my students too, um, so I'm not only learning from the professional artists in the school, but I, I do think I'm learning a lot from my art students also. Um, so this is an example of a homework that I gave them um, to look at geological layers in their home. And they really expanded my understanding of the way that we can look at environmental and human history together. So they not only looked at soil layers, but they looked at um, how in Chicago, the newer buildings are layered over the older buildings that experienced the Chicago that were decimated by the Chicago fire. And so they're really expanding my, um, yeah, how I look at environmental history with human history. And um, I really like this quote that one of my students um, left behind. I'll just give you a second to read it um, about how reading the layers is like a code for reading time and how. Um, it can help us slow down as people in the way that we observe different layers that exist in nature and in the environment around us. So I liked, um, yeah, I think that there's lots of learning opportunities that are going on in at the Art Institute. Um, and so, yeah, it just makes me feel like excited and that we um, can perhaps learn a lot from artists and that maybe art can help improve some of our approaches as researchers in the way that we design experience experiments and in, in the way that we um, engage with people and the human history that is underlying a lot of the natural systems that we observe as geochemists. Um, so that's my hypothesis. I will spend some time, many years exploring that hypothesis about art, but I just wanted to share that here um, with this community and end with um, just the main bullet points of what I talked about in case anyone had questions. And then I put some contact information 
at the bottom in case there's any reason that you would think my um, position at the Art Institute would be useful to you, um, I encourage you to, um, or interesting to you, I encourage you to contact me. And that's it. So I'm at 43 minutes. So. Oh, great. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate so much, you know, uh, about your talk. It's not only a fantastic science part, the POC, but also how to transfer the knowledge to the community. I think this is a very, very important part. And I think this talk series, we need more like this kind of activity. Particularly, I guess, when we put it online, that more and more uh, high school, community college student could be also come here, want to watch this kind of river delta environment uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, talks. And I think this is great. We need more to particularly, I think your work, your job is very important to give this artist and some kind of sense of environment change, climate change, like uh, the movie star who the Leonard uh, DiCaprio, you know, he, he mm. talked about climate change. I think it's very important. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we have uh, 10 minutes uh, before 10. And so I know a couple of people had to run. And uh, Jim, uh, you raise your hand. I know you have a class 10 o'clock. Go ahead to ask questions, Jim Best. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks ever so much. It was a fascinating talk. Yeah, I just had, had two questions. Um, the first was, I noticed you get your uh, POC flux from looking at the uh, backscatter intensity of the ADCP. And ju just wondering how, how you did that. Uh, and the second question, I, I, I'm not a geochemist, is what, what was the oldest POC that you actually found? And what I'm wondering is, is when you think about the Amazon and you know, the range of different age terraces, is m much of the uh, POC, you know, very, very old carbon that's coming from those really old terraces? Ah, uh, yeah. So, oh, for the first question with the ADCP, um, we, we use the ADCP primarily to reconstruct water velocities. So we didn't use backscatter at all um, to get particle concentration or anything like that. Uh, we just looked at it to get, we just used the ADCP to get water vo velocities. And then um, we used some previous models for depth related sorting of sediment concentration in the Amazon to, um, to, you, to basically extrapolate our depth specific sediment concentrations into the whole cross section. Um, and then the product of that was, was our um, sediment fluxes. Okay, no, I was interested because it looked like the plot that you had, it looked like you had the sort of flux across the whole of the channel at Overdos, which, which looked, I yeah. just think it was the way that you got that through the backscatter. Yeah, yeah, actually, it was just an extrapolation. Yeah, um, we, we followed uh, some of the work that has been done using this model um, at Obidos and other and the Solomois and Madeira rivers in in previous expeditions. So we just kind of reconstructed the cross section um, just through extrapolation, just filling in the gaps. So um, there could perhaps be inaccuracies because we didn't measure sediments in all the, you know, the, everywhere. So this is just based on point observations of the, the what's on the right, our heat map on the right. Okay, okay. We didn't, yeah, we didn't um, take, we didn't use the ADCP directly to get um, particulate organic carbon or particulate organic matter concentrations. We just used the depth specific samples and extrapolated from there. Okay. And okay. then, oh, this... Sorry, yeah, sorry, go ahead, sorry. And then the second question, um, okay, I will admit it's been a while that I looked at the radiocarbon data, um, but some of the oldest pools had a fraction modern of 0 0.4. Did someone else in the audience, do they, can they convert that in their head? I can't remember right now how old that is six, in the carbon ages. Six or 7,000 years. Okay, I knew someone would know, thank you. Yeah, okay, I had, I was afraid to really be off by order of magnitude. So yeah, so that hopefully gives you an idea. There's certainly even older pools. Perhaps we think there's a very small component of petrogenic organic carbon um, as well, which is even older. So, but um, our best, our oldest measurement is is still a mixture of even older things in there. I guess I want to say. Okay. Okay. Many thanks. Oh, Dave. Anybody? So, Dave, you have a question? 
Yeah, sure. Um, wonderful talk, Sarah. How fun to see the ramp pyrolysis stuff applied mm. to the nature of POC in the uh, Amazon. It's just mind boggling and fun. Um, mm. I, I think back of the old uh, Hedges carbon 14 paper on the Amazon where he had the coarse fraction was very young and probably particulate leaves and stuff. And the old, fra the very fine fraction, which was probably associated with the sediment and soils was, uh, you know, thousands of years old. Um, did you do any um, uh, grain size fractionation in the POC to see if there was a coarse mm -hmm. labile fraction versus a fine soil fraction? Or density. Density might show you a similar thing where the uh, coarse kind of leaf litter might be much less dense than the uh, uh, terrigenous laden uh, soil profile carbon. Yeah, so uh, I do remember doing that. So the, we had depth profiles of bulk radiocarbon and there wasn't much depth related differences in the radiocarbon. Um, and so we thought that, we didn't really think that there was that much difference, that much more of that perhaps less, more buoyant, less dense, um, fresh organic matter. Um, mm -hmm. And you may notice that we combined all our fractions into one major fraction. Um, we didn't do the same separation as hedges above and less right. than 63 microns in diameter. So we looked at just everything over 22 microns in diameter. Um, so, and I, and I did do grain size. Um, I did do grain size analysis. I don't have that data right here. Mm, so I can't remember the differences that, well, in general, I guess the grain sizes were higher, deeper down um, in, uh -huh. in, the, in the cross section in the deeper samples. But I will say that um, I, do, I do know that the, that is the result from the hedges uh, work. Um, however, interestingly, no matter what gas fraction that we separated out, um, we weren't really able to get a very modern signature for, the, for organic carbon that would reflect really fresh vegetation. So that's kind of right. one of our big results. Because some of these, the gas fractions um, here, if you look on the left, the bar height is radiocarbon age. And um, that is a relatively, maybe that that's at, is at most a quarter of the organic carbon that mm -hmm. is in that sample, in that first gas fraction, in the, in the youngest gas fraction. And yet still, it is not very close to a modern age at all. So we really think that the vegetation component is, is quite minor, which is a departure from the hedges. I think it's a bit of a departure from the hedges conclusion. Yeah, very nice. Um, I had a question. You kind of uh, have equivalence between uh, temperature of the pyrolysis and the activation energy. Um, how would you uh, see the trends also in, you, you mentioned, um, molecular diversity, but also turnover time. Do, you know, do you see trends that it might be associated with temperature? You know, it seems like mm -hmm. you get more complex molecularly uh, as you get the higher temperatures. Uh, mm -hmm. You have kind of geopolymers that would turn over more slowly. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as you see you've taken the jump to turn it into activation energy. I'm wondering if you're willing to take a jump and put in some idea of trends in molecular diversity or trends in carbon, microbial carbon turnover time. So I guess to me, I'm not ready to make that jump with molecular diversity because what would be ideal though, is if I could get a thermogram, um, Okay, so what I, I started thinking of thermograms, especially with my colleague, Jordan Hemingway, we started thinking of thermograms as the narrower they are, the less molecular diversity there is. So um, I can't really say that for the higher activation energy pools, I would like to see if I could make those pools a separate thermogram in itself as well. I think that 
that would answer the question. So I'm not ready. I wouldn't make that jump yet. You know, I don't know. I don't know if I can link the higher activation energy pools to something about their intr intrinsic molecular diversity. Um, but turnover time. I mean, I guess I would. What I what I'm seeing happening in the Amazon, or how I conceptualize it, is. Um, there is mixing of different soil organic matter pools that have their own turnover times in the terrestrial biosphere. The older stuff, it's older. So it's turnover time is longer. And the younger stuff, the younger soils, they're younger, their turn, turn, turnover time is faster. So you have a mix of soils that are turning over at many different rates. So yeah, I guess the activation energies would be, the higher activation energy would reflect um, slower turnover times in, in the terrestrial pool. In the river pool, we're not sure. We'll have to compare with, I think, a lot of the work that Brenna, Kirsten, Brad, and Valier are doing in the mud banks in the coming mm -hmm. years, hopefully this summer. Okay, cool. Great, hey. thank you. Hey, Bob. Yes, um, I'll join in and say that was a really nice talk. And I, and I um, totally agree that this interaction between researchers and the people in the areas that they're carrying out research. Uh, the communication in both directions is incredibly uh, important and one of the most enjoyable aspects of doing research. So I thank you for really emphasizing that component. My science question is the um, uh, specifically concerns the thermograms and it's along the lines that Dave was just asking you about, but I'm interested in how do the mineral organic matter associations how do those, if at all, influence the activation energy calculations that you make? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Um, let me think about that because, uh, well, Jordan Hemingway's most recent, my colleague's most recent paper connecting molecular diversity activation energy was somewhat about that. And I hope not to say it in the opposite direction, but mineral preservation. Um, I guess you would expect that mineral preservation. Okay, I don't know if this will answer your question, but mineral preservation, the idea is that it maybe would promote di diversifying of organic matter. Mm, di yeah, I guess it would lead to greater diversity of organic matter through time if if there's mineral protection as that organic matter ages um and so i think it's interesting in the amazon it's pretty old the soil organic matter but the thermograms are relatively speaking not very um molecularly diverse um compared to other thermograms that you get especially thermograms in other river systems and so this is really um, perhaps the argument here that we're making is that the, the narrowing of this thermogram in the Amazon really um, perhaps reflects selective preservation rather than mineral protection of Amazon POC because the molecular diversity is relatively speaking relative to other thermograms is not um, very high. If we make that jump from thermogram the overall thermogram shape to molecular diversity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question super well. well I, to, to just give an example, I was, I was particularly interested in whether an association with, Mont, with a Montmorillonite, for instance, might, might give you a different thermogram than an association with kaolinite, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I didn't explore, that's a very good question. And I know that there's other people trying to, to answer that, looking at how thermogram shape is, is um, driven by the um, presence of minerals that can protect the organic matter. Mm -hmm. That's, I didn't really think about that much in this project though, but I, I feel like I should have. So thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody, any question? Sarah, you look like in a PhD defense. You know, uh, the people, David DeMoss, Bob Eller, <laughs> Jim Best, the other one, mm -hmm. the best expert in the world to study Amazon company, you know, Amazon system. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here's a little bit easy question. 
And so we all know the last couple of years, Amazon River Basin experienced a tremendous, huge of the fire, destroy the you know, rainforest. And even the farmer deforestation, they put so much fertilizer on the, on the land. So how this will affect, you know, burning is one thing. There could be some old carbon, new carbon, you know, going into the river. And fertilizing definitely will boost the primary production, you know, in the both in the river and the coastal environment. How this will affect that kind of uh, organic carbon signal in both the estuary and the near shore environment? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, well, you're making me wonder how we would see the impact of black carbon and maybe, um, autochthonous production in thermograms, which is an interesting question, whether we can somehow tease out that signal with the ramped oxidation technique, so that's cool. Um, uh, yeah, I guess the paradigm is that black carbon, for example, you would think that it's recalcitrant um, in the environment, and so that would affect the burial of that organic carbon in and its persistence in the mud banks. Um, but I know that that's being revisited now in recent years, whether black carbon is in the ocean is truly marine or terrestrial derived. Um, and so, uh, but the paradigm has been that black carbon is recalcitrant to organic matter degradation. So you would expect more burial of that in the, in the mud banks. Um, and then fertilizer, that's very interesting. I, I didn't think about that much, but I guess if you expect like in the Mississippi river shed, more fertilizer and more organic carbon protection, you would think that that's in the marine system that would be more um, labile because it's fresher organic matter being produced. I, I hope Valley, you know, this coming summer, mm -hmm. if he can really go there, hopefully with the new sampling, uh, maybe have some, some interesting funding, you know, about this. Signal. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I know is uh, people uh, has already begun to 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 uh, to leave. And if, any other question? If not, thank you, Sarah, so much. Sarah, I'm sorry. Could you back to your okay? Uh, could you back to your first slide uh, because oh, yeah. we yeah. I missed the recording the first couple of minutes of your talk. I want to at least keep a record. Maybe I try to do something later to to make that part, you know. But I want to in the in the beginning, you know, at least in, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. can move down from a little bit, you know. Oh first yeah. Slide. Yeah. Some something information is a re echo, you know. So uh, uh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and nice meeting people that I have never spoken yeah. to before. So nice meeting you all. <laughs> yeah. So Sarah, maybe we can talk up because like, uh, you know, the Mekong system, the Eurowadi system, we need that kind of a social connection component mm -hmm. in our future research. And uh, if you have that kind of experience, maybe we can talk a little bit, you know, over yeah, the Myanmar in Vietnam, even in uh, Ganges, that's just, uh, we really yeah. need that kind of, uh, you know, expansion. Yeah, I would love to help. I'm spending more time these days, I think, on that. So I would love to help you if I can. Yeah, we can yeah. talk. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, cool. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Bob. And sure. Good so to see you. Thanks, Sarah. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Sarah, what journal? Sarah, what journal is the Jordan Hemingway 2019 paper in? Nature. It's in nature. Yeah. Okay, so uh, no. I missed I the big one. Sorry. Thank you. Called, uh, selective preservation of organic. Jordan Hemingway. You should find it. Oh, Valley yeah, nature. Sure. Yeah. Sarah, how about you just to drop Dave an email? You see, Demaster at NCSU. I, I can get it. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. You're retired. You don't need to read other people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll find it interesting. And thank you for your questions. It's nice meeting you uh, also in person. So. <laughs> Okay. okay, cool. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.